Bonjour à tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, panel session. My name is Diana Iglesias. I'm an uh, Innovation and Programs Director at Genome Quebec, and I will be uh, moderating this exciting session. Um, I just want to mention that this session will be dedicated to uh, Louis Bernatchez, who left us too soon, two weeks ago. And if you allow me, I will do, uh, remind us of who Louis was. Uh, Louis was born and raised in a small community where he spent uh, time outdoors observing nature and going hunting and fishing, which was his passion. His strong and deep connection with nature always stayed with him throughout his career. Louis received numerous honors for his contributions to scientific advancement. In addition to his Canadian research chair in genomics and conservation of aquatic resources at Laval University, he was a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was a recipient of several major awards, including the Prix du Québec Marie-Victorin and the Molecular Ecology Prize. He was also selected into the Hall of Excellence genetic section of the American Fisheries Society. And he was an, one of the eDNA research pioneers with more than 600 publications on this topic and was the founder and editor-in-chief of the Environment DNA Journal. Besides his academic excellence, Louis will, re will be remembered as a great mentor. He ran a big and active research group, carrying extensive hands-on training on graduate students, postdoctoral research fellows, and research professionals. And I think the impressive flow of people passing through his lab shows to which extent mentoring was very much part of Louise's daily life as a scientist. At Chinam Quebec, he, we will miss his energy and dynamic leadership in many projects, but particularly in the Fishes Project launched in 2019 with the aim of finding ways to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change on communities that depend on freshwater and anadromous fish for both consumption and cultural life. So um, I would like to take two minutes to tell you who we are and what we do. And in case you didn't have the chance to visit us on the fourth floor at our booth, please do so, so that you can get to know us a bit better. Um, Genome Quebec is part of the Canadian Genomics Enterprise, which is a pan-Canadian network comprising Genome Canada and six regional genome centers. Uh, we work in partnership and across sectors to invest and coordinate in genomics research, innovation, data, and talent, and talent to generate solutions to today's biggest challenges. This network is key to our impact, facilitating regionally focused programs, proactive business development, and strong industry connections across the country, and it enables alignment of regional strengths and needs with national priorities. Particularly, Genome Quebec's mission is to catalyze the development and excellence of genomic research and drive its integration and democratization. Our core expertise are funding of genomic research projects, delivering genomic services through our technology platforms, harnessing the power of big data, and engage with the public through education and social acceptance programs and we operate on all sectors where genomics is present, health, agri-food, forestry, and environment. So today, we have a, a very distinguished panel. We have three researchers whose work has been funded by Genome Quebec and members from the Genomic Enterprise. And they are here today uh, with some of the receptors of the technologies being developed, uh, who are also actively participating in the project. Uh, so we will start the session with very quick presentations of these projects, and then we will get into a conversation um, around adoption of these new technologies and knowledge transfer. So I will invite first Valérie Langlois, who's full professor at Hauteur Environnement Research Center at the Institut National de Recherche Scientifique, who's here today with, she said her, her Johnny, <laughs> Jean-Christophe Gay, <laughs> uh, who is environmental advisor at uh, Hydro-Québec. So Valérie. OK. 
Okay. Uh, I guess I'm... There we go. Okay, well, I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, I have five minutes to quickly introduce you to iTrack DNA, which is a large four years project. It's a multi million project funded by Genome Canada, Genome Quebec, and Genome BC. Um, and this is a very uh, large also project with many stakeholders stakeholders across Canada. And I should say that uh, Louis Bernacci was one of the co-PI of this project, so thanks for this, uh, um, this nice introduction. Um, so this project, as I was saying, it's a multi-stakeholder project across Canada. So we have federal government, provincial government, the private, uh, the industries, NGOs, First Nations that are involved. And really the project here, it's to um, develop standardized eDNA, environmental DNA, and environmental RNA, eRNA kits um, that can be used, uh, readily used for our stakeholders. So as you can imagine, we have many stakeholders with many interests, all interested in different, um, uh, to sample different uh, part of biodiversity. So today, for the purpose of my four minutes left, I will be speaking uh, about one of our stakeholders' engagement, which is Hydro-Quebec. Hydro-Quebec, as most of you uh, know, are part of the uh, produ producing the hydroelectricity in Quebec. So um, their interest into the iTrack project was to develop eDNA and eRNA kits for uh, four different species. So the first one is the American eel, and the reason for that is an endangered uh, species that uh, use um, the rivers for their reproduction, and when um, the, the eels are coming down, uh, there's a high mortality rate. So um, using um, the ratio of eDNA and eRNA, we want to be able to uh, further establish if we could better track this um, lost, um, this, uh, this mortality, but also if we could increase um, viability. Um, there's also, um, uh, a parasite that is uh, affecting those eels that we also want to have more ideas where um, the, the populations are being affected. So we are developing a EDD kit for that. And for leak extrusion, um, when we, well, I say we, but when Hydro-Quebec are um, uh, adding dams or whatever, they are changing the flow path of the river. So it's affecting some of the spanning ground of the lake sturgeon. So often we, well, hydro is remaking some spanning ground, but it's important to see if they're gonna be utilized by the fish. So at the moment, the way they are doing that is very invasive as it's using the eggs of the, uh, the the sturgeon that are living in the, that habitat. So we're trying, again, with the ratio of eDNA and eRNA, trying to see if we can not better detect that or uh, using a non-invasive way. And the last, I want to say that there's a little mussel that actually uh, lives on that the sturgeon and are very, um, they're at risk. And uh, it's very interesting to be able to uh, track those without like having to catch the fish themselves. So we are also uh, using, uh, developing an eDNA. So this is just a quick status of all the kits, the design where we are uh, uh, for each of them. And then, um, I have two last slides, so one on the eels, just to say that we are at the, the point of actually going in the field and testing the technology, but at the same time we are doing eDNA and eRNA ecology in the lab to see all variables such as temperature, um, pH and different contaminants that can be uh, present in those environments could interact, interfere with the production and the degradation of those molecules, so we want to make sure that we can better predict and uh, at last, um, the kits that we uh, designed for the lake surgeon were already used last year and this year, and they really confirmed that they are well working, and they can predict when, uh, with temperature, when um, the, the, the fish are coming on their breeding ground. So it's really, well, it's working well so far. And um, yeah, so this is, that was just a, a quick five minutes, maybe I'm even past my time uh, to present just tiny little part of this very huge uh, project, which is iTrack DNA. And we have a website, and we welcome collaboration, so if you're interested or if you're in need of any uh, uh, eDNA, RNA, eRNA uh, kits, just let us know. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, the next project will be presented by Jennifer Sunday, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biology at McGill University. And she's here today with Catherine Abbott, Research Scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Thank you, Jennifer. No problem. This is not my talk. Do you want to switch? Oh, sorry. Okay. Let's switch then. Sorry about that. <laughs> so. We will present um, Claude Robert, full professor at University, La at University of Laval. Um, he's here today with Joël Taillon, a research biologist at the Ministry of the Environment and Fight Against Climate Change, Fauna and Fisheries from Quebec. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, so, so this project is actually, uh, has been completed since uh, last uh, June. So, so we, we were contacted uh, to, have, uh, to develop a tool for, for the Ministry of Wildlife, changed name over the course of the project, but basically uh, they, had, they had an issue about, uh, and, and the point was to, uh, to survey uh, caribou population in the province of Quebec. Um, Basically, you can see here on the left uh, that there are a few populations, and the ones in the blue are the ones that are migratory, and the head counts were about 800,000s and maybe in the mid-80s, uh, mid-90s, Joël, correct me if I'm wrong. And, and um, the decline has been very important. Uh, some of these uh, herds have been declining by 75% to 99%. Uh, in the green, you can see uh, the portion of the caribou uh, living in, in the forest, and, and it's uh, a lot less known about uh, how, how many they are and what they do because they, they, they have been less studied. And you can see at the bottom there are some isolated herds uh, which are associated with the ones that, are, that, that, that were cut off, and, and, they, and they're isolated. So, so there are questions about inbreeding and uh, about the uh, capacity of, this, of these isolated herds to survive on the long term. So um, the, 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 the standard microsatellite tools were very useful, but uh, they were probably not providing enough, uh, um, I would say, contrast or uh, uh, details. So, so, so we'll, after discussions, we decided that we would go with a SNP chip uh, that would address probably much more information on the same genome. Um, so we, we, it's talking to each other and working with each other and having discussions that we were able to, to, to set you know, the, the, the goals. So what do we want to accomplish? And in the end, uh, we also wanted to have a tool that would be uh, available to all caribou and rain, reindeer populations. So uh, to, 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 to define a catalog of SNPs that would be useful for everyone, uh, we, we, we sit and decided to sequence and, and do some G, uh, GPS sequencing, uh, whole genome sequencing uh, for many population, including the ones that were not in Quebec, so uh, uh, populations uh, across Canada um, and, and across uh, Eurasia. Uh, so with this, uh, we, we, we set up an, uh, a large SNP catalog containing millions of, of SNPs. And we decided to select uh, some. Uh, so as you can see here, there's uh, 63,000 63, or so uh, SNPs that were selected. Um, you can see in the, in the blue box uh, why they were selected. So we have a panel that covers the entire genome uh, at a regular interval. And we have another one that was uh, specifically dedicated for uh, a um, population uh, assignment. And we have another, uh, with, through a collaboration with the University of Calgary, with uh, Marco Musiani, uh, we, 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 he had identified uh, SNPs associated with behavior, uh, migratory or not. So, so we included all these SNPs on the, on the, on the panel, and, and basically the, the goal was to, uh, to see what we can do with, uh, with it. And, and this is a, this is a results where uh, we compared um, the, uh, uh, what the genomics says about the, where the animal is from, uh, if, you, if you look at the different herds. Uh, and, and on the right side, you can see what the telemetry says uh, based on radio coloring. And, it, and you can find Charlie here and there, but uh, there's not many. Uh, you're going to see that some of these spots are in the wrong, um, uh, like, let's say, like, whoop, not this one. Anyway, you can see some of these, because I don't know how the laser works. Um, but just, ju just showing that the, the, uh, 
for most of the wrong assignment, they are actually coming from a neighboring uh, population. So it's uh, so what we think is our uh, re recent uh, migrants. Uh, so we're very pleased with the with, with the SNP chip. It provides a, a good description of the population. So uh, in terms of uh, usage, uh, you can see here uh, that our end user um, is is using it uh, to to assign animals uh, to populations. Um, they also look at the networks uh, and, and you know, uh, links between the populations, uh, kinship. Uh, you can see the impact of uh, uh, genetic diversity, so inbreeding, um, and, and the impact. What's going to be the true benefit, I think, is going to come from the analysis of the, the spatial temporal analysis. So we can see how the populations are evolving in time uh, with the very precise description of the genome. So we can even identify how many animals are, are part of the reproductive uh, uh, subpopulation. So uh, I would like to say that the SNP chip is available to all. You can go uh, and see uh, Illumina directly, or you can, you, you can contact Genome Quebec. Uh, they have an, an excellent uh, center for expertise that, that handles the sample and do the hybridization, and, and they have access to the SNP chip. And to bridge with uh, the preceding panel, uh, we're also investing in, in Genovalia, which is a, a database or a data hub that we're, we're, we're setting up because we, we, we understand that there is a, a true benefit also to make uh, the, the data not necessarily public, but at least accessible. Uh, through different, you know, partnership uh, agreements. So, so, but at least we want an, we want the data to be discoverable, so people will know that it exists, and then be interested and in maybe collaborating. So, for instance, in, in this Caribou project, the data is not mine. I don't have any data per se because uh, I'm the one who generated the tool. But the data is to the owner of the sample, and the owner of the sample is the Ministry of Wildlife. So basically, uh, we can put the data available, but you would have to contact Joel and then, and then find out if uh, you know, it fits with their mandate. Uh, we have a website, which is at the bottom there. So if there's anything, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. straight into it then. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project that's, can I go back? Yeah. Oh, there it is. There we go. Thank you. Um, also supported by Genome Quebec and Genome Canada, um, as well as the Hakai Institute on the west coast of Canada. Um, and it's a work in partnership with Fisheries and Oceans Canada to help them fill some gaps that they have. Um, and so here's the problem. Canada's marine protected areas, you can see them here. They're, they, there are many, there are very different sizes. You can probably just see the big ones here. Um, they're difficult to access. Many of them are focused on deep water habitat and, um, and they're also expanding. Canada just keeps wanting to, to which is fantastic, uh, right in more marine protected areas. Uh, but the monitoring is not able to keep up. Um, and so environmental DNA, uh, metabarcoding is a possible solution, uh, but in talking with the, uh, the, my agency partners at Fisheries and Oceans who are in charge of doing all of this monitoring, um, they need to know how certain they can be about their findings before they can start um, putting in investments. And so the question that we're focused on is how much sampling effort is required with eDNA metabarcoding to provide an acceptable level of certainty for management decisions. And so we thought a lot about this. This is a sort of a picture here of like we expect the certainty to increase with the number of samples we take, the depth of sample sequencing, the amount of replication, how proximal our sample is to the source habitat or organisms. Um, and so we expect all of that to increase the cost. So is any of this going to lead to certainty that we can make decisions on? And so our strategy, I'm just going to talk about one part of the project here, is to oversample. So we uh, collected um, about 210 independent uh, eDNA samples at depth in nearshore habitat, so we're, we're focused, um, on the west coast of Canada. And we're uh, asking, we expect species richness to increase with sampling effort. 
Uh, but more importantly is down here at the bottom, what we want to try to talk about is how the effect size of change, so what is the biodiversity change that we think we want to detect, how will our detection ability of that change in, um, increase with sampling effort? And it's actually, the relationship is maybe counterintuitive. We expect we can only detect big changes if we only sample a little. The more we sample, the more small changes or more precise changes that we can detect, the more certain we can be about those changes. Okay, and so we expect this declining relationship where the greater sampling effort is more refined uh, definition of change. Uh, and so we went out and did all that sampling. We, with our partners at the Hakai Institute, we did all the metabar coding. We've got a beautiful reference database for fish. I'm just going to talk about fish right now. Um, and so we, as we expect, the fish species richness increases with the number of samples um, that we collect, which I'm showing on the top graph. And now I'm just going to focus on these two bottom graphs. The, um, the number of samples that we collect in this region as we expect, the detectable change in fish richness, so that the units here are number of fish species, declines. So we can say now, oh, if you, if you want to detect a change of about six, um, then make sure you take 60 samples, but here's what you'll get if you only take 20 samples uh, every time you go and sample. We can also look at um, community change, so turnover. And so here I'm just going to show, um, oops, wrong way. Oh. I broke that thing. Anyways, it also declines the, the number of samples per site. It looks very much like the first graph, except the units are quite different. So again, we can say, well, if you sample this much, um, this is about how much change in community similarity you're going to be able to detect. Um, and so now we're trying to refine all of this into a decision tool for, um, for Fisheries and Oceans Canada, but I think it could be generally used. So the first is just to start exposing what fish we're seeing, and this is helps just user uptake, and of course we want this all to be interoperable with OBIS and GPIF, so we're working with Oban for that. Um, and, uh, and we're also working on a big coastal observatory project that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow if you come to the later session. Um, but the next thing that we're working on is a decision tool um, so that the users can say, okay, well here's my habitat depth, here's my size of my MPA, Here's which markers I'm planning to use, and here's my desired level of confidence. And then some of the outputs can be something like you saw, which is um, an estimate of how much sampling is needed for a desired amount of change. And so with that, I just want to thank all the people that are part of this, and thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentations. I think I, I enjoy them a lot. <laughs> and um, we want to jump into the conversation about um, adoption of tools and knowledge transfer. So my first question uh, will be, so the, the research funding model from the Canadian Genomic Enterprise requires uh, researchers to early identify, define, and understand the public benefits that the project is going to be achieving and the user's needs. And so that requires uh, a deep understanding of, of what the, those public benefits will be and what the actual uh, needs are from the users in terms of the services or the technologies that you're going to be transferring, and not only from the users, but also the people that are going to be impacted by the products that you're developing. So maybe I'll start with you, Valérie, because you have an impressive list of collaborators and end users, and ask you how this collaboration was set up, and what do you think are the key success factors for this collaboration to keep going? Okay. Well, um, I can speak first of all in general for the project and then maybe more specifically with uh, Hydro-Québec. So um, like uh, you said, it's a very large project. So basically it took two years 
to just set it up, right? So two years of um, you know talking with people, um, trying to um, to see the needs of all the stakeholders, all the the different interests. Um, we we came up with a list of over 500 species of interest from our stakeholders, and just uh, it's really expensive, right? So we could not do all that. So we we had to prioritize. But really, I, I would say that the key is to take the time to talk and like to be human again, right? So take the phone and have uh, meetings, and and that that's the best uh, the best approach. Um, especially with First Nation, takes way more time because human uh, relationship is way more important than <laughs> perhaps our society, the, the way that we, we work in, in whatever cities or in our um, culture. But uh, yeah, so it's very important to establish a strong human connection first. Then after that, we, we can ask what their needs are, right? So uh, yeah, I would say it's a long process. What about you, Claude? <laughs> well, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, you, you can't impose uh, your vision. You have to listen to what the end user wants and basically answer their needs. So, so we sat down and we discussed about uh, what they needed and, and what are the options. And then when we agreed on what we would do, and basically if, when you do when we're, what was agreed upon, it works. Simple. <laughs> Jennifer? <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, I would say that I could say that the funding call uh, was a big push for us. So, you know, I, I, have, I know lots of people that, that work in fisheries and oceans that are thinking about marine protected areas, but it, it's like Valerie said to act, and Claude said to actually talk to the, on the phone about like what, you know, oh, let's, let's do this project. And then it takes a second to be like, well, what, wait, what, what do you guys actually need? And what and 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 how would that change our way of thinking? So so at one point, talking with uh, my my end users, we had a conversation. We just sketched out on a piece of paper this idea of certainty and sample size, and it was it was only through that conversation, I think, that that we got the idea that that is what's needed. Otherwise, we probably just would have been following our own track and thinking, oh, this is probably useful, but it's that conversation. Okay. And uh, from the perspective of the end users and in your own working experience together, what do you think drives the adoption of innovative practices by you? And I would like to hear from all of you. <laughs> so you can start, Katri. It's on. <clears throat> okay. Um, I will speak to my experience uh, working in the federal government. So this is mostly with uh, natural resource managers and conservation managers. Um, my experience is largely that existing methods don't necessarily meet their needs uh, well or arguably at all in some cases. So even though we struggle with adoption of genomic technologies, I think because there are barriers which we can talk about later, um, I think uh, the reality is that the standard right now is the bar is actually quite low in terms of what current tools are doing for natural resource managers and conservation managers. So this, these are people under pressure to generate impacts and have these desired outcomes from their efforts. And the, they're often working in a very data deficient environment and I don't think that's often recognized, but I think that's the case. So, with new tools like genomics, we have this promise. And I think because they're under pressure to be successful and they're working, you know, with data deficiency, genomics tools, they're, they really do offer an incredible amount of information. Like they're really populating kind of what otherwise is black boxes. You know, huge scales of um, environment, like geographic space, for example, where we, don't even know if a species at risk is there because it's completely under surveyed, right? So um, I think I'll just leave there. I know we're kind of short on time, but yeah, I think that's what drives their interest largely in my experience. Thank you. How about you? So my situation is quite similar to the one to Katrin. So I'm a biologist researcher at the government of Quebec. So we already have a, a toolbox to monitor wildlife biodiversity 
to take into action with management and protection actions. But we have to update our toolbox, and Genomic is one of the ways to update it. But still, we have limited time, limited budget, so we need easy to use tools. And for that, we could use it by ourselves, but we need very strong collaboration and service that are available to us as Genome Quebec. And we need reliable methods that can be used at different scales, either spatial or temporal scales. So a tool that can be used for different uh, needs. Um, also, we need to understand what come of those tools. We need to understand the output of those tools. And for that, we need very strong collaboration with genomic researchers, genomic groups, uh, to, because it's a very um, rapidly evolving field. And as a researcher, I cannot catch up with all new things that are happening. So very strong relationship, as Claude said, mutual understanding of the needs of the expectation. And by talking about expectation, also understanding the strengths of those methods, but also the weaknesses and the limits of those. Because when you don't understand all of that, you can make a lot of hope or put a lot of hope on those new methods without understanding that they cannot answer everything. So we have to, you have to understand the big picture of it. Thank you. Would you like to add? Yeah. Uh, as a fish biologist, I, Hydro Quebec, as you may imagine, we have a big print on uh, on the landscape, so and we have a large uh, uh, impact or possibility of impact of a lot of uh, aquatic system. And uh, since I've worked in hydro, it's like 19 years now. Uh, I always use a classic method for sampling, as is mostly fishing or getting eggs, thing like that. And there's limits of what those methods could give us, uh, give information for, for us. So with the DNA, uh, the, the, the limit of uh, the question you could ask and the answer you could have are exploding. So it's very interesting for us to be able now to answer a question that we weren't able to do just 10 years ago. So it's why we, we, we start working with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Louis Bernatche uh, f many years ago. And then 2018, starting with DNA and after ADNA in water, so to, it could be used at the, the, uh, a lot for, for a lot of questions we have regarding uh, reproduction, reproduction period, um, the, 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 the monitoring of the population in, in a reservoir. Uh, we could ha have now access to uh, um, uh, very low abundant uh, species uh, information that we cannot get with the, the next thing like that. So we were very interested as the moment that we, we, we hear about the ADNA, we're okay, that's a nice tool possibility. So we have to have, have good uh, tools and that's why we decided to invest uh, in uh, Louis Bernatche's uh, lab in research and to, to have good tools that, that could be uh, more, uh, spread uh, and accepted by uh, uh, authorities too to have a, a, a new box tools to, to give us faster answer often and also it could be able to, to, um, to sample like large reservoir, for example, Manic 5. If you go fishing there, it's gonna be two months of fishing. You go with, with EDNA sample, it could be just one week of, uh, with, with to, to get the sample, so it's, it's quite interesting. That's why we decided to, to, to work with the, uh, the university on, on this topic. So if I get it well or correctly, if you nail the needs of the users, the adoption will follow quickly. And as long as the tools that you develop are accurate, reliable, implementable, if you want. Okay, so you mentioned um, Catherine and, and you too, Joel, um, barriers. And I was wondering what the barriers for the adoption would be and what would be the strategies to overcome these barriers? I don't know who wants to, to take that. I open the question to everybody, not only the end users. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, right, in terms of overcoming barriers, I think there are 
uh, several that are some potentially more obvious, like technological or infrastructural. I think there are workforce related barriers in terms of, um, I think we, we almost, we need a field of, of new graduates who can be environmental diagnosticians for us to populate labs that we don't have yet. Um, but I also think that, um, I think there are some barriers. I think that there's a translational process going from science and research into implementation that may not be fully recognized, that that's a journey more than it is a step, especially when the technology is new. I think we could use some initiatives that are focused specifically on that and develop uh, like a, a mode of thinking where we pilot translation, you know, where we do, um, you know, we pilot the usefulness of a new tool rather than just develop it and then say, it's so good, it's, it's going to be used or going to be useful without actually nurturing that step. Um, I think a non-technical barrier is um, that just at large, like societally, culturally, I think this is a post-colonial effect, we, we assume that nature's benefits are gonna come for free. And if you look in the genome space, uh, what we spend on healthcare or agriculture, for example, versus what we spend on the environment is drastically different. So I think there's a, a paradigm shift kind of in our thinking that's gonna need to happen because genomic tools aren't free. Well, um, when we were talking with our, all our stakeholders at the beginning to try to understand, yes, the, the, barrier, the barriers as well, well, many came up, but one, well, in the eDNA kit development world was the standardization, right? So it's nice to have all the kits, but if, if we, every lab is doing different things, then it's hard to compare, right? So, so that's why one of the, the main goals of iTrack DNA is to actually come up with uh, a new standardized uh, protocol for uh, analyzing eDNA and eRNA to uh, some extent. So we uh, pair up with uh, the Canadian Standard Association and the, the standard should be uh, out like any weeks now. So this is at least, you know, one thing we would have done from the project, which will help the field as a whole. And it's also, you know, the first standard, standard on EDN analysis in the world. Doesn't work, and now it works. <laughs> so it's the first time, anyway, that that uh, standard. So Canada is gonna be the pioneer on that. So I think this is good for, it looks good for Canada, anyway. Thanks. So just before coming, I did a little survey with my colleagues. And one of the main issues that they had was about knowledge transfer, meaning that they're, for them that are not, they're not using genomics that much for now, but they would like to. But there's a lack of information on the potential and possibilities of using it. So, and what I realized is that we need to think outside the scientific standards, meaning not just publishing in scientific papers, it's not how you get the information out to end users and to people that would like to use it. So one of the things that we have to, to, um, to think together is researcher using, uh, using genomics or doing project and end user, we have to raise awareness on the potential and the possibilities um, would be through informative session like today uh, to training courses, classes that could be done that could be put up, and just to focus on concrete example exactly yesterday with all the three projects that were presented, to better understand what can be done, how it can be done, and how you can use it and add it to our toolbox. So I think for me, knowledge transfer, it's, it's on the, the thing on what we should work on. Well, if I can <laughs> add to that, I think that was also something very important to us. Uh, people who know me know that, that it's very important. Uh, so for the I tried DNA, for example, we did like a movie, right, to, the, to show people, like it's very basic, right, to just to show like, you know, what, what is eDNA, what can we do with it. We also developed like a training program, one for like just 
like the population, but one for like the technician. So we are invited like every year to SeaTac uh, uh, Europe to go and train European that are interested scientists or other people that are interested in, in learning more about eDNA. So I think I think we are trying to do everything we can do. I'm also writing a children book, <laughs> but you know I can do what I can. But I'm just uh, you know it's all of us together. We have to not just do one thing. We do we need to maximize like everything we do. We do work workshop like with Genome Quebec, we designed like a workshop uh, on eDNA, the Biodome of Montreal just asked me if they could use it for in all time at the Biodome. So I think we are doing what we can, but you know, yeah, remember, I don't know why he doesn't like me. Um, uh, yeah, so, but we're just one person or a few uh, of us, so we just need to be uh, all of us doing it. So, but I agree, it's so important. But I, I'm including myself as an end user in the, in the loop of knowledge transfer. So the, the, the work I've done with Cloud, I'm talking about it to all my colleagues and showing them the possibilities. So I'm involved in a little part of iTrack DNA. So I'm trying to get that information out. But a lot of my colleagues are working with hunters, with fishers. Um, so, and they're looking at, oh, what can I do with genomics? How does it work? So. It's, 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 go, it's going on and we have to still work on it. I think I'll just add that in, in meeting with end users quite a bit as well as well uh, local groups who, who are working some of our kits on another project is uh, there's this two part, there's like the, uh, like sort of seeing the vision and what's possible and, and what's possible now, not what's possible in the future. Uh, and then there's, um, and then there's just the invitation, like the openness to be part of it, because it could feel very, I think it could feel like, oh, something other people are doing, unless I, ca unless I learn all about genomics and all about, you know, it's a big learning curve. So, so the inclusivity and then the, the basic understanding um, is a lot of the, the work, but then it captures so much of imagination um, and, and people's, uh, it's like, a, it captures a new audience, I think, too. That just, I mean, even that we're talking with Gen Genome Canada about biodiversity, I would say like probably 20 years ago, it, the biodiversity was over here and genome was medical, you know, it was other stuff. And now it's got, we have a whole new audience. Yeah. Uh, I, I could talk as, as a end user and uh, we use a lot of DNA, uh, we, we do DNA study in, in Hydro Quebec and we have some small issues, not it's not the same as education, we, we are fish biologists so we know what is uh, eDNA, but to be sure you got it explaining that to First Nation first. Uh, I worked since 10 years uh, on the Société Salmon de Rivière Romaine, which, uh, where we use DNA for uh, salmon, salmon uh, uh, genotyping and it's really hard to explain how, how we could trace a fish, individual fish with DNA. So eDNA, it's, it's more than that. So you go, oh, you fish water, and you could tell me which fish are in, are you serious? So it, th that's one, one thing. The other thing is the, we have a, a lot of sample, and we miss a laboratory to, to make the, 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 the analyzing. So it could, uh, it could add long delays uh, over a year sometimes to get the data. Sometimes we need the data faster than that because we have authorization, we have, issue, we have a dates of, of to, for reporting, things like that. So th there's two issues we, we have at uh, Hydro-Quebec, it's, it's that. I think this, we're at the point where it's the init, it's starting, so it's, it's a, Point, point, but it's a it's a changing period now. I think in the next maybe five years there will be a, a lot of students that will be uh, uh, they will know about that, and we will have uh, 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 tools that will be uh, uh, certified and uh, uh, a reference. And I think it's, the future is really uh, interesting for ADNA, uh, and it's also for hydro. A uh, last thing is it's you could have best result with uh, less money invest because it's. Uh, Quite less expensive to fish water than to fish to to uh, to, to fish fish. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Basically, what what comes around for um, my own experience uh, working with uh, the several types of stakeholders, people in agriculture and, and in in uh, environmental uh, studies. What comes if if you ever want to engage uh, with uh, with a stakeholder, they want to know uh, the price per sample. 
how, the, 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 how much time you have between the sample and the data, and how much time and how, how autonomous will they be to analyze the data and get and get the, the, the graphs out of it and the information out of it. So basically, you have to cover these bases when you engage, and then basically you get their interest if, if, it's, if it fits with what they need. So price, uh, time, autonomy, that's pretty much uh, covering uh, what you need to first engage a, a new stakeholder. So I see there are t there's a technical component to the barriers, but there are also barriers, or I, I wouldn't call them probably barriers, but points where we can work on, which are education, um, a bit of an economic barrier maybe I heard. Um, is there other barriers that you think uh, could be playing a role, political, reg economic, uh, yeah. regulation? Well, uh, I saw that in some cases, especially in agriculture, some of the barriers were actually uh, data accessibility. If, 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 you, if you say that the data is going to be in the public repositories, they won't, they won't engage because basically they can't put their data out there. So, so we have to figure out a way to get the data private but discoverable, at least what the, the, that the data exists, and then you know through through the appropriate uh, contracts, then you get access to the data. So so so, a lot of a lot of people don't engage because they they're afraid of losing their their uh, authority on the data. Any comments to that? No. Okay. So I will throw another question in. I was just wondering. Oh, the time. We don't have more, more time. Oh, okay, sorry. So I was so carried <laughs> this discussion. So I want to thank you very much for your presentations and the discussion. It was amazing. I think it's a topic that we need to continue discussing to make sure that genomics makes its point in helping people. And I want to thank the audience for being here and participating. If you want to ask questions, I guess you are available for questions. Down there? Okay. So thank you very much and uh, keep enjoying the conference.